and welcome all the attendants, but especially uh, uh, Professor Ernst Kamsjäger, who will be, be the speaker of today. Um, he is associate professor at the uh, chair of mechanics at the Mon Montana University in, uh, in the Oven in, in Austria. He's been there since 2010 in this position. Um, and his research fits perfectly well in this series of lectures. It's about thermodynamics, phase transformations, micromechanics of materials. That's exactly the things we, we want to look at. He received the prestigious Massing Memorial Prize in 2010. That's the prize of the uh, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Materialkunde. Um, as I said, his research, is uh, the topic fits perfectly well in this series. So I'd like to give him the words with the uh, title for his presentation being Face Transformations from a Modeling Perspective. Hans, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Sitzma. Thank you, Yilt, for this very kind introduction. And uh, yeah, I will talk uh, about phase transformation from a modeling perspective. And please, oh, also, please allow me to show uh, a university town, beautiful town, Leoben in Austria. And here is the entrance, main entrance of our university. Now a little bit more than 180 years old. And uh, yeah, started in a mining tradition. And uh, I also want to acknowledge my co-workers, Dr. Manfred Wiesner from Anton Bar Company and my PhD student, Daniel Ogris. And the experiments with the high temperature laser control microscope did Volk Dr. Volkmar Kircher and uh, Dr. Jerzy Svoboda and Steve, mm -hmm. Professor Sipan van der Swach are also long time scientific companions, I would say. And I acknowledge this very much. So my talk will be in three parts. First part is thermodynamics from heat capacities to thermodynamic functions. And then we uh, switch to thermodynamics of irreversible processes, cyclic solid liquid phase transformations. And uh, finally, I want to characterize uh, high speed steels. Yeah, from heat capacity to thermodynamic functions, uh, the heat capacity models are. Oh, Please mute yourself. Okay, please mute yourself, or okay. I can also do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the heat capacities. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, the law of Toulomb Petit and Einstein and Debye. And uh, with Debye, integ uh, Debye Einstein integrals, uh, we can describe all thermodynamic functions and uh, these. Uh, Fitting models will be evaluated by a local and global optimization tool, and it can be applied to a wide range of crystalline materials. So to introduce the capacities, classically one thinks of atoms which behave as if on springs, and then the elongation is a sine function of time, and uh, the force is proportional to the elongation, and one can calculate the potential energy, which is then a function of time, and also the mean potential energy. And the derivative of the elongation is the velocity, and therefore one can calculate the kinetic energy uh, as a function of time, and again, uh, also the mean kinetic energy, and the sum of the two, the potential and the kinetic energy, which appear to be the same, gives uh, the uh, whole energy of uh, the atomic uh, spring. And the mean value of the kinetic energy we know is related to temperature. So we can relate the uh, energy, sorry, we can relate the energy of the system uh, to uh, the temperature and uh, of our 
uh, one atom it's uh, three times the Boltzmann constant times temperature and for one mole it's uh, then three times the gas constant times temperature and one can easily calculate uh, the heat capacity which is then uh, at constant volume uh, 3r which is the law of Toulong and Petit and this turned out to work reasonably well at room temperature for heavier elements, but is a really pure fit at low temperatures. And therefore Einstein came up that the energy is quantized. So we have a, a quantum uh, energy, a quantum atomic spring. And with this model, uh, the experimental data are fitted much better. And there has been even an improvement by Debye who thought that there is not only one atomic spring, but they are all connected in the crystal lattice. And this then gives a real good description of the ultra low temperature range of the heat capacity. And so why do we need accurate models for heat capacity? So nowadays we have very precise uh, calorimetric measurements for uh, the heat capacity down to very low temperatures. And uh, we want to describe that here, for example, with uh, this uh, six parameter fit with uh, some constants and the Debye and the Einstein temperature. And uh, from that, we can calculate all other thermodynamic functions like the entropy, like uh, the uh, enthalpy and the Gibbs energy, of course. And yeah, then with this accurate model, uh, we can put all these experimental data into this uh, four, uh, to, into this uh, six constants, of course, and then we can uh, calculate all the other functions. And what is also good with this uh, Debye-Einstein approach is that uh, it's possible to extrapolate data. Very often, we don't have a low, ultra low temperature data, but all the measurements there we uh, can on there the people could only measure down to 50 Kelvin. And uh, then this Debye Einstein approach allows to extrapolate the data in a useful way. And then to get uh, all thermodynamic functions at room temperature, for example. And yeah, this was the approach by Kelly and King. And yeah, very often uh, the precisely measured heat capacities are measured by, uh, um, are modeled by various uh, polynomials. Here you can see, for example, in the temperature range between six and 10 Kelvin, there are already four uh, coefficients. And, and, uh, and then there are a lot more and uh, sometimes uh, this uh, leads to overfitting. And here is, is another example where we have low temperature fits, mid temperature fits and high temperature fits. So high temperature begins here at 37K. And also the temperature ranges are quite arbitrary. So 1.9 to 7.46. Uh, but the high temperature fit here used here, uh, we use that uh, for, for the whole range. And I think we could show that for many materials, this is, uh, is really sufficient. And uh, so this is what I want to show you here with the molybdates. These are the experimental data. And of course, the heat capacity have all to start uh, at zero Kelvin at zero. But uh, in order to for you to see better the measurements, uh, I shifted the uh, strontium molybdate heat capacity by 10 Kelvin and the tophario molybdate by 20 Kelvin and uh, lithium molybdate by 50 and silver molybdate by 60. And uh, yeah, here you see the experimental data. And uh, with uh, these uh, fit functions, so uh, three prefactors, 
and the Debye temperature, which is uh, here, the fitting parameter, and the Einstein, uh, one Einstein function and the second Einstein function, all these molybdates and many minerals can be, uh, the thermodynamic data can be uh, described very well between zero Kelvin and room temperature. And here you can see this for the molybdates. And yeah, this is was uh, done by a local fitting procedure. So least square fitting Levenberg Marquardt with uh, the help of origin. And uh, yeah, you can see also here in this insert that also for the very low temperatures from zero to 20 K, uh, the fit are quite good. This is not, not always the case, but for, for molybdate dates, it worked very well. And here we have uh, different uh, minerals. So uh, quartz and cerusite and holandite structures. Holandites they use, for example, to immobilize a high, uh, high risk uh, nuclear waste. And so they want to know the um, thermodynamic uh, properties of these materials. And uh, for all these materials, we can see that uh, yeah, when we try to fit uh, these uh, data and uh, by the levenberg marquardt fit algorithms, and here you can see the atoms in the formula unit and from the theory, of course, the sum of M plus N1 plus N2, this where the prefactors uh, has to be uh, the same as the uh, number of atoms in the formula unit. And, but the levenberg marquardt algorithm does not know anything about that, of course. And yeah, it approximates the theoretical value, I think, uh, in many cases quite well. So here, here is maybe a bit deviation, but th this works quite well. So it's a uh, empiric approach, but with, uh, I think, which makes uh, physical sense. And now we want it to uh, test this uh, local uh, optimization routine with, with a global optimization by Bayesian statistics. And uh, there we start with a prior distribution with some uh, assumptions. And uh, then uh, from the measurements and the calculations, one can uh, calculate the likelihood and uh, this is done by a Monte Carlo Markov chain algorithms in order to get the best posterior distribution and uh, the model parameters, uh, the uh, three prefactors and the Debye temperature and, and the two Einstein temperatures. And here is uh, the comparison between least square method and the Monte Carlo Markov chain uh, method. And you can see that uh, the mean value and also the uncertainty are uh, really in, in the same range. And here with the uh, global optimization routine, we also calculated something like, yeah, it, it's a standard deviation. So um, uh, uncertainty, um, the uncertainty range we calculated here more or less. And yeah, uh, with the global optimization, we always get a probability density function and we can calculate the mean value and the value of the highest probability. And here for different temperatures, we can see the, the CP values. And the mean value is always practically on the curve. We also got from the uh, local optimization routine. And with that, one can now calculate with uh, levenberg marquardt or with bias uh, all uh, the, the CP values, of course, and the entropy and enthalpy and the planck massieu function, sort of a uh, Gibbs energy. And yeah, they are really, really very similar. So 
um, I would like to advocate this uh, six parameter approach uh, always to use for uh, materials uh, below uh, be below room temperature to describe uh, the thermodynamic functions. And here uh, we tried it for uh, pure elements. So for unaries, uh, here is silver and an old approach. So this uh, Kalfa third generation gives this fit. And uh, of course, uh, the Debye is uh, makes makes the fit uh, then a bit better, at least until room temperature. And and here, uh, what we also calculated, as I said, is uh, this uh, confidence interval here, uh, plus sigma and minus sigma. And here I plotted the residues versus temperature. Yeah, and uh, I, I think uh, this it, it works quite well to uh, approximate heat capacity by these uh, Debye Einstein functions. And yeah, to conclude this first part, this was a theory guided fitting approach with rather few fit coefficients. It, it is possible to predict uh, the heat capacities when we have only experimental data for temperature higher than 50 K. And it's applicable for a wide range of crystalline materials. Essentially, when you have no phase transformations in that range, uh, then it's easy. And uh, I think the pure elements and uh, hand members, unaries, should be described in a sort of uh, standard way by, by such an approach. So, and now we uh, switch uh, from equilibrium thermodynamics to the thermodynamics of irreversible processes. But, uh, and uh, yeah, we know why do we use thermodynamics because when we have uh, six times 10 to the power of 23 particles, it's not possible to calculate all the equations of motions. And uh, so uh, now uh, we look at uh, Equilibrium thermodynamics uh, for in an one representative volume element, can we calculate a temperature and the chemical potential when we have uh, 10 to the power of six atoms inside this RVE at least. And uh, then we can uh, calculate all these properties locally and uh, finally uh, minimize uh, the system here when T and P is constant, we minimize the Gibbs energy. And, but uh, two neighboring RVEs, uh, volume elements, they can be have a different chemical potential. And uh, then we could assume uh, that uh, the difference in this uh, chemical potential uh, is proportional, for example, uh, to the flux of the components. And uh, then we have, uh, we take into account uh, irreversible processes in the framework of this uh, local equilibrium. And uh, with maximizing the dissipation uh, and uh, using balance equations and possible other constraints, we come to the evolution equation in the sense of irreversible processes, or uh, we come to the equilibrium when we simply minimize uh, the Gibbs energy. And the evolution equations, of course, finally uh, lead to a steady state or to the equilibrium also. So now to the irreversible processes part, we want to look at cyclic solid liquid phase transformation in the CAO SEO2 system. And uh, first I want to say what are cyclic, cyclic partial phase transformations. This was introduced by uh, Professor van der Swaag and his uh, co-workers. And 
Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll show this in a minute. Uh, as an experimental tool, we have the high temperature confocal scanning laser microscope. And uh, then we will compare the experimental results with the modeling approach. And, and then I will conclude this part. So uh, what is the psychic partial phase transformation? Uh, in order to avoid nucleation processes, uh, it's uh, good when both phases, here the solid and the liquid phase, or the austenite and the ferrite, both are present. And uh, when uh, uh, the front is migrating and uh, the time for nucleation is not uh, consumed. And in order to achieve this, one has to cycle between in the uh, two phase region, or at least make sure that both phases are always uh, present. And yeah. And we did the experiments with this laser confocal microscope. Uh, there you see, in the middle here, you see this uh, gold coated, uh, it's an ellipsoidal uh, oven. Uh, and here in one uh, focal point, uh, there is the halogen bulb. And here is the uh, specimen, uh, which is heated very locally. And the big advantage of this device is that you can go up to 1650 degrees Celsius and you can get, get up to very high heating rates, uh, 50K per second. And uh, now we can look at 50 frames per second dynamic processes. So one, for example, one can observe uh, martensitic needles when they are growing and and see this uh, in situ. And, uh, but uh, here we have uh, the, um, the, the oven inside, the, we look inside the oven and uh, this is the uh, platinum crucible with the thermocouple here and uh, there uh, when, uh, before the experiment starts, the powder comes in which uh, then will be uh, melted at the high temperatures. And here is a platinum wire where the solid phase can nucleate. And then we have here the solid liquid front, uh, which uh, grows or shrinks in this. And here is uh, the, the temperature treatment we had for this. And we look at uh, two different compositions. So one is where diffusion is required during melting and solidification. And the other composition here is at the maximum in the phase diagram. So the, no diffusion is required. And we look at the differences between these uh, two processes. So this is incongruent melting and solidification. And this one is congruent melting and solidification. And uh, now we can also, uh, here we go down with the temperature and uh, the solid uh, phase will grow. And then when going up with the temperature again, will uh, shrink again. I will show you that in so a sort of a movie. So here the time go grows and now it's growing, growing, growing. There's the maximum extension and then it, it goes back. So, yeah. And uh, we did this for uh, inconcurrent and concurrent melting, or solidification and melting, I have to say. And in the inconcurrent melting, you see here sort of an inverse transformation. So the temperature goes already up and but still uh, the uh, solid is growing and uh, the same is in the concurrent case but in the concurrent case uh, what is missing is a sort of stagnant stage so here in this uh, during this time almost 
nothing happens. But uh, in the during the congruent case, uh, you don't have this uh, very slow phase transformation or almost stagnant stage because uh, the diffusion of the components is not required so that the solid liquid front uh, advances. And yeah, we tried to model this here with a local equilibrium also at the interface in case of incongruent melting. Uh, and then we have the diffusive flux and the diffusive flux uh, has to be equal to the interface velocity and the uh, concentration of uh, CO here. And we have to equalize the uh, interface flux and the diffusive flux. So this is uh, essentially uh, connect, this is more or less the, the mass balance. And uh, we cannot use uh, this uh, linear uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics here with uh, the chemical driving force and the interface velocity because we uh, assume local equilib equilibrium at the interface. However, in uh, and uh, yeah, so the rate controlling process is diffusion of the components in the liquid bulk. And uh, here, in case of congruent melting, uh, the interface uh, is linearly related to the chemical driving force. And of course, uh, no bulk diffusion is required. So only uh, this equation um, is uh, responsible for, for the migrating interface, for the velocity of the migrating interface. And yeah, here you can see again the ink situation at the incongruent so interface. Incongruent. And uh, we have the, the liquid phase and uh, here the solid phase and the common tangent construction. And uh, in case of uh, the concurrent phase transformation, we have the liquid phase and uh, the uh, solid. And uh, there is uh, a parallel tangent construction for the maximum dissipation. And these parallel tangents, they come closer and closer until they are the same when, then when a global equilibrium is reached. Here is uh, the finite difference mesh, how we calculate it in case of incongruent uh, melting solidification uh, the situation and yeah here again a uh, difference uh, we have here the incongruent case uh, experiments and and modeling so and you see here there is uh, a slowdown of uh, the phase transformation sort of stagnant stage and in that case this is uh, over a much shorter time. And here we have a sort of, a, uh, we, we have no stagnant stage. And uh, this is the, the model. Uh, maybe here the temperatures at the sample are a bit, uh, are, are a bit uh, lower than uh, in the, than, than written here. So there is a bit of a deviation. But I think uh, generally the both curves uh, fit quite well together. And so as a conclusion, we can see that inverse stages and stagnant stages occur during incongruent melting and solidification. And no stagnant stages uh, occur during congruent melting solidification. And with quite simple model of bulk diffusion control in case of incongruent melting and with interface reaction control in case of congruent melting, one can model uh, these, uh, the kinetics of this phase transformation. And I think these both models are simple and versatile models for materials processing and might be applied in steel and refractory industry and can be used for materials design. 
And now I would like to come to the uh, third part. This is characterization of high-speed steels. And we want to come from suitable heat treatments to desired micro microstructures. The experiments are from X-ray diffractometry, dilatometer tests, and hardness tests. And the X-ray diffractograms are analyzed. And then the ex evaluation of the experimental data are supported by machine learning algorithms. As the motivation, yeah, we want to come from suitable heat treatments to desired microstructures. And so I show you the experimental setup. This is uh, to uh, measure uh, the X-ray diff diffractograms. Here we have an X-ray tube with a Goebel mirror, and we can select the chrome car alpha 1 and car alpha 2 with a parallel beam optic. Uh, here uh, is the HTK 1200 oven by Anton Bar, and here we have a, here we have a position sensitive detector. And so this is how a typical diffractogram looks like. And uh, we can analyze the peak areas. And from that, we get the phase fractions. And the peak positions tell us the lattice parameters. And with the width of the peaks, we can uh, see the influence of crystallite size and the lattice strain. And in order to analyze these diffractograms, usually one uh, uses Rietveld method, method with a fundamental parameter model. And crystallite size and lattice strain due to dislocations can be separated by the double forked model. And now we want to look at high speed steels. And uh, this is the composition of this uh, steel grade. And when treated, uh, when heat treated in a good way, uh, one uh, gets a very, very good material properties. Um, and, and they can be used as a source, for example. And here we look at different heat treatments. The time here is the T8 by 5 time, means uh, this is the time uh, during uh, cooling uh, when coming from 800 degrees Celsius to 500 degrees Celsius. And you see for very uh, small times, 110, uh, you, you get martensite. And for 300 seconds, also Martin side, and uh, then uh, the amount of uh, bainite is increased. And uh, for very uh, small uh, cooling rates uh, and cooling times, one uh, gets uh, finally uh, the paralytic, paralytic structure. And here also from X-ray measurements, one can uh, get the tetragonality, which you see for here is uh, the tetragonality plotted versus the D8 by 5 time. And you see for Martin side, there is a high tetragonality, and then it goes down for Bainet and Martin side, and it go goes even down for when a uh, ballot comes into play. And a similar trend has the hardness, which is on uh, plotted on this scale. So it also goes down from martensite to bainet and martensite mixtures down to perlite. And we did also dilatometer measurements. You see for 110 seconds, uh, practically only martensite will come. You see here that uh, the martensite uh, appears. And for 300 seconds, it's a uh, martensite, but there is also a little bit of bainite, and then it's martensite. 
for 800 seconds, we have uh, bainite and then a little bit of martensite. Uh, and then we have here upper bainite, lower bainite, and almost no martensite. And for the very long uh, cooling times, we have here first perlite and uh, here first perlite and then a little bit of bainite also. Yeah, you can see the compositions. And here, here uh, is the phase fraction as a function of uh, this uh, cooling rate. We see again at high cooling rates, we have martensite. Uh, we have uh, almost 100% bainite in the uh, in the middle range of uh, cooling times. And for the very low cooling times, the amount of perlite is increasing. And uh, here are now 10 different data sets from the diffracto, uh, 10, diffract 10 different diffractograms. Uh, here, starting with martensite and uh, then going to perlite. And uh, for example, here, when you look at the perlite here, you get a very, very uh, sharp high uh, peak uh, of the alpha 101 peak. And uh, it, it looks completely different here. And uh, we know, of course, uh, which uh, data sets belongs to which uh, heat treatment. Uh, but now uh, with hierarchical clustering, one can uh, tell uh, the machine the different uh, diffractograms here. All these 10 diffractograms uh, are provided for uh, this uh, hierarchical clustering uh, procedure. And a cluster means that uh, the uh, program wants to sort, uh, to find uh, different uh, similar groups, uh, properties. And so first we have uh, all, all these diffractograms are one uh, cluster. So we have uh, first 10 clusters and then the program tries uh, to uh, to put uh, the uh, closest clusters uh, together. This is done here with the method of word. And uh, the result is here. So uh, zero and one, these are the uh, martensite and martensite bainite. And then from two to five, we have martensite and bainite uh, and, and more bainite and uh, then uh, from uh, six to nine, I think there also comes then the perlite. And so uh, now we, we could uh, set a level bar here. So distinguish between the martensitic steels and the martensit and bainite steels and the bainite and perlite uh, steels. And uh, now uh, by this uh, unsupervised machine learning tool, uh, one can uh, um, put uh, a diffractogram into the computer and the computer auto automatically knows uh, what heat treatment that was or if, if there will be uh, martensite or martensite and bainite or bainite and perlite. So this could be used for automatic analysis of uh, heat treatment in steels. So uh, we did uh, experiments uh, with X-ray diffractometry, dilatometer tests and hardness tests. And uh, with a quite a simple program, automized, automatized analysis of in situ that uh, uh, seems to be possible. So thank you for your attention and uh,
please, uh, if you have any further questions or interested interest in this word, uh, write me an email or give me a call. And uh, yeah, of course, if you think this is interesting for you, I'm also uh, very, I, I would look very much forward for possible uh, scientific corporations. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>